We like to think that we have a hand in what happens in our lives, that we make the decisions. But our next guest says this may all be an illusion. Joining us now in Boston, Massachusetts, Ellen Langer. She's a psychologist at Harvard University. And Ellen Langer, we welcome you to TVO tonight. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Glad to have you aboard. There are many random events, of course, that happen in our life that are uh, beyond our control, that have a, an enormous impact on our life. Do our actions and beliefs reflect this fact? Uh, no, quite the contrary. Uh, what people tend to do is uh, suffer from an illusion of stability. I have been studying this concept of mindlessness and mindfulness for almost 40 years, and I feel fairly comfortable in saying that most people, much of the time, are just not there. They're holding things still to get that certainty, oblivious to the fact that everything is changing and everything looks different from different perspectives. Tell me about this poker game you partook in in uh, the 1970s that helped form your doctoral thesis. Ah, okay. <laughs> yes, I was playing poker with uh, other graduate students while I was at Yale, and uh, somebody dealt the cards, and rather than give me the next card, which was uh, what was supposed to happen, they gave it to the person after me, and all of these very bright people yelled, misdeal, and they took the cards and made us uh, go through another... Uh, another shuffle and dealing of them. Um, it was odd because it didn't make any difference whether it was that card or the next card that was going to be mine. It was face down. You couldn't see it. And so I said, something strange happening here. <laughs> and so I started paying some attention to people's beliefs and the magical ways people tend to think and developed um, at that time what I called the illusion of control um, to show that... Um, People find control so important that even in situations that are entirely chance determined, they behave as if they can control chance. Does feeling like we're in control actually improve our well-being? I believe so, yes. In very early research, what we did was to um, give nursing home residents choice, and we found 18 months later when we returned that there were more people in this group that were still alive than in the comparison groups. And we've gone on to pursue that in many, many studies. And I now see choice as operating basically based on this concept of mindfulness, which is very powerful to uh, actually give us control over our health, well-being, so, and competence. OK, you just mentioned mindfulness. And of course, the, the, there's the other concept of mindlessness. And how, how would you compare right. the two? <laughs> as opposites. Right. Um, and essentially, that uh, when people are mindless, they're on automatic pilot. They're not there, but they're not there to know that they're not there. Hmm. When people are mindful, they're actively noticing new things. And when you notice new things, that puts you in the present, makes you sensitive to context and perspective. And the act of noticing these new things um, is what uh, leads to the feeling of engagement. So it's actually very exciting. and. Um, you know, you have lots of people in uh, pop psychology who say, be in the moment. And that's very good advice. But the problem is, when you're not there, you're not there to know you're not there. <laughs> the simple process, noticing new things, is how to be there. Okay. So in study after study, uh, you, you want me to stop or should I? No, I was just, if, if you've got more to say, that's good. But I want to come back to the nursing home in a second. But go ahead, finish your oh, thought. Oh, come back, okay. And I was just going to say that uh, when we make people of all different ages and all different situations more mindful, we find an increase in competence, an increase in happiness, an increase in health, and back to the nursing home study, an increase in longevity. Well, that's where I wanted to get to. What, what the, the story that's you told I took a moment us right ago. right back there. Right on. You are good. I got to tell you, Ellen Langer, you are good. <laughs> so the inference you drew from your experiences in the nursing home and that which you just told us was what? Well, first, that uh, the mind is far more powerful in affecting our, our health and well-being than most people realize. Um, that um, to engage uh, the world around us is actually much simpler than many people believed. And so then I went from that to studies on health and um, well-being. And now you've got this book, Counterclockwise, Mindful Health of the Power of the Possibility. Uh, and the power of possibility, forgive me. And I want to talk okay. to you about this counterclockwise study and what you saw as the goal of the study to begin with. 
Well, um, I had um, some thoughts with the members of my lab, my students, that we have ideas of mind and body, you know, and that um, what has plagued researchers, philosophers for years is how do you get from the mind this fuzzy thing called a thought to something material, the body? And I thought, well, wait a second, mind and body really are just words. And if we put the mind and body back together, then essentially wherever we're putting the mind, we're also putting the body. So we went ahead and did the first study on this, which was the counterclockwise study, where we put the mind of old people, these were uh, elderly men, they were in their 80s, and that's when 80 was 80, not the new 60. <laughs> and we had them live in a timeless retreat that was retrofitted to 20 years earlier. They were going to live in that environment for a week as if it was 20 years ago. So they were going to be speaking about the past in the present tense, surrounded by um, props and things from that earlier time, to see if we could put the mind in a younger place. And we had a comparison group that also spent a week at the retreat, but they were speaking about the past in the past tense. So for them, it was always clear that now is now, then was then. And then they engaged in discussions, watched uh, television shows, saw movies, and so on to help get them back to that earlier time. And what instructions and, did you give each of the two different groups? Well, the instructions were not much more than I just said, that the, they were told that we were interested in how much they could remember from the past. And so for the experimental group, we told them the best way to do that is for them to act as if it was this earlier time. Ah. And uh, they were supposed to correct each other if anybody came back to the present and so on. And what'd you find and out? The re <clears throat> yeah, the results were amazing. Well, first we had taken photographs of all of the men um, before we started, and we had them evaluated at the end of the study by people who knew nothing about the research. And the group that uh, <clears throat> let themselves go back to the past were rated as looking much younger. Now, they didn't look 50 years old, but they still look significantly younger than they had when they first got there, and younger than the other group. Their cognitive abilities increased, their gait, their strength, um, their vision, and I believe their hearing. And what was interesting was while this experimental group outperformed the comparison group, they also improved over the course of that time. You know, here you had people who have been overhelped for a life, well, for, for many years, where they're thrown into this new environment where essentially they're in charge. And I think that um, that was a good thing for, for all of them, actually. And you think that's um, the explanation the, of why they acted younger? I think that's the explanation for the comparison group. I believe that the experimental group actually had primed for themselves their younger selves. And, you know, there's nothing sacred about 20 years ago, five years ago. The point of it was to prime an earlier time, a time when they felt vital. And so while they allowed themselves to be in this time feeling vital, um, their minds were more vital and, you know, um, Given the hypothesis, so too would be their bodies. And the, the evidence seems to uh, support that. M very recently, actually, the BBC did a series with me uh, to replicate the findings with uh, British celebrities. And um, they did a beautiful job. It was actually nominated for a BAFTA at British Emmy. Mm -hmm. And um, again, you saw right in front of you now on camera uh, the remarkable changes that unfolded. So if I can sort of draw us back to the theme of our overall program here, would you say that believing in luck or the power of chance or that kind of thing can positively affect your health? I think um, believing that you can affect the outcomes that matter to you in life is crucial. Uh, you know, that um, on the one hand, it's important to recognize that we can't predict. That uncertainty is not the exception, it's the rule. Things, again, are always changing. And we try to hold it still to gain control, but we're actually going to have more control over our health and well-being by recognizing and exploiting the power of this uncertainty. What we do have control over, though, is the way we feel about, can act in response to 
whatever events um, happened before us. So we don't have to control chance. All we have to do is realize that we're more capable than we tend to think that we are. You know, now, I had, uh, I, your turn. Okay, my, I was just going to say, this sounds a bit like a Hollywood <laughs> movie, and in fact, it's going to be, right? Who's playing you? Yes. Well, um, it's, uh, it was initially going to be Jennifer Aniston, and I don't know where things are right now, but it will be somebody who looks nothing like me. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's going to be wonderful. For me, the excitement about it is to be able to teach this concept on the big screen to you know, millions of people, mm -hmm. because to me, it's the, it's the essence of what everybody is seeking. Simple process, noticing new things, you feel engaged, it's enlivening, literally and figuratively. Hmm. Okay, then uh, just for what it's worth, if you get Jennifer Aniston, your chances are you probably are going to get millions of people seeing the movie, so you might want to... Oh got... yes, no, it'll be... No, and she's delightful. I've spent some real time with her, and uh, what I like about the choice of Jennifer is that um, uh, she's very, very authentic or such a good actress that she appears authentic. <laughs> and that's, that's what I value most about myself. Gotcha. Let's, uh, I talked to you, I want to follow up on this mindful versus mindless issue that we talked about just a few moments ago. And I want, to, I want you to talk to us about the Xerox copy study as an example of what mindlessness does for you. Go ahead, pick up on that if you would. Well, uh, this was the first, uh, the first research that we did. We had people go over to people in a Xerox machine and ask if, um, you know, excuse me, can I get ahead of you because I want to make copies, and given that there's not much else you can do with the Xerox machine, <laughs> or could at that time. Uh, and uh, well, we've done many more sophisticated studies since that, but I don't think people need to be persuaded about mindlessness. People are forgetting their keys, or walking in, into mannequins and excusing themselves, are missing appointments. Um, people, I think, are well aware that much of their lives uh, is on, they're on automatic pilot. And I guess the news is that it's far more prevalent than most people realize. And again, that the antidote to it all is very simple. And what did you find out when you know, people, you, people wanted to cut the line for the Xerox machine? What did you find out? What we found out was when you give a reason, and if I say, excuse me, can I get ahead of you, um, that uh, people don't let you. But if you say, excuse me, can I get ahead of you because I want to make copies, um, then they allow you. you know, <laughs> it uh, sort of follows the script. Um, it's like going to a restaurant and, excuse me, can I have the reservation before you because I'm hungry? <laughs> Now, that, that, on the face of that, that doesn't make any sense, though, does it? I mean, of course, of course no, you're there to make copies. that's the point. Yeah. If you right. wanted to but introduce some sorry. element of time pressure, maybe that would, that would do it. But uh, any excuse yeah, work, no, I'm eh? sorry, Steve. I didn't, I, I didn't make it clear. The point is that it makes no sense. Yeah. But that people don't, people don't really listen. Hmm. You know, they take a word or two of what is said, they think they know, and they don't pay any attention. And it's that thinking that we know that is um, hurting us. Um, you know, what I started to say before was that the belief that we can predict, which is part of our belief that we know what's going to happen, that things are stable and predictable. Um, I teach this uh, advanced decision course to, um, at Harvard, and every year I ask them, I uh, say, okay, I have been teaching a version of this course for over 35 years. I've never missed a class. What is the likelihood that I'm going to be here next week? And I go around the room, and these are Harvard students, so they know not to say 100%. They say 97, 96, as if there's some way to calculate that. Mm -hmm. After they've all um, made their case that I'm going to be there, then I have them go around the room, and I have everybody give a good reason one that's believable to them, why I might not be there. And the first person invariably says, well, you've always been here. You deserve the time <laughs> off. The next person says that your dogs have to go to the vet. The next person, you get a flat tire, and so on. And after we go finish going around the room, generating the reasons why I might not be there, then I ask them uh, to come up with uh, the probability. And now it goes from virtually 100% to 50%. Huh. So we're good at postdicting at figuring out why we did what we did, coming up with a reason, but we're not very good at predicting, nor should we be, because 
things can be understood in many ways and as I said, keep changing. So when you're mindful and you're noticing new things, you're um, able to take advantage of all these changes and avoid pit holes um, before they even arise. Hmm. When you're mindless, you just go forward thinking, well, this is the way I've always done it, and things change. An example, let's say um, you're taught that people of my age, possibly your age, I, I don't know just how old <laughs> you are, we're taught that when you're uh, driving the car and the car starts to skid, what we're supposed to do is slowly pump the brakes to regain control of the car. Well, that made sense at time one. People keep doing it mindlessly. Now, because there are anti-lock brakes, what you're supposed to do for safety's sake is firmly hit the brake. And so we learn something to be safe, we keep doing it, and now it's no longer safe. You see, we freeze our understanding of things rather than let things more naturally change. Hmm. This has been fascinating. Professor Aniston, I mean, Professor Langer, awfully good of you to join <laughs> us on TVO tonight, and I hope you'll join us again sometime. Thanks so much for being there on the I line from Boston. It. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.